All right, so today we are going to continue talking about the chemistry of biology because like I said last time, uh, in biology, chemistry is a really big deal. So let's jump into it. So today we're going to be learning about elemental diagrams. Um, we're going to be talking about how to draw shells and dot structures using electrons. Don't worry, this is all new terminology. You haven't heard about these things before. We're going to be describing chemical bonds and why they form. Uh, so today is gonna to be kind of the underpinnings of that. We're actually gonna get into the details of this in a future, in a future lecture. We're going to be identifying the reactants and products that are involved in a chemical reaction and how you might write that um, in a sort of chemistry sort of way. We're going to be starting to describe elements using the periodic table and we are going to be differentiating molecules and compounds. So last time for a bit of review, what is an element? What is an atom? An element is like gold here. Okay, so these bars of gold are all made out of the exact same kind of atom. And uh, that's what makes this elemental gold. It's all made out of the same exact stuff. And if you took one of these gold bars, remember last time you could break it in half, and then you could break that in half. And you could just keep on breaking it down until ultimately you were left with just a single atom. All right, here's my stock photo representation of what um, a gold atom looks like. It's got this nucleus, like 79 protons and probably 79 uh, neutrons, and it has like these 79 electrons around the outside. So that is, this, this is an element. The smallest unit of an element is an atom. All right, so just wanna make sure that's super clear. So now let's talk about what is a molecule and what is a compound. So I'm not actually super interested in this distinction, but I want you guys to know it in case you're ever talking to someone. I just don't want you to be confused uh, in the conversation, but a molecule is something like O2 or oxygen. Okay? It's a molecule because it's more than one atom that's bonded together, but it's the same kind of atom. So O2, Cl2, H2, O3, stuff like that is all molecules, all molecular. A compound is multiple different kinds of elements stuck together, like our friend CO2 here. Okay, so all compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. I think I said that right. Anywho, I'm not going to test you on that. I just want you guys to know that there is a difference um, between these two terms. Okay, molecules aren't the same thing as compounds. I'm probably going to just use them interchangeably, though, because I'm a biologist, not a chemist. I'm not super concerned with the distinction. All right, won't be on the test. So let's go back to thinking about electrons and subatomic particles. Quick review. You should remember protons have a positive charge, neutrons have a neutral charge, and both protons and neutrons live inside the center of an atom in what's called the nucleus. We are going to be discussing cells later on in the semester. Cells also have a nucleus, uh, but the nuclei, the nucleuses of cells are very different than the nuclei of atoms, okay? But you have protons and neutrons inside the nucleus, and you have electrons orbiting around the outside of that nucleus. So protons, neutrons in the middle, electrons around the outside. So let's draw a Bohr model of chlorine. I don't know if you guys remember, but I talked about the Bohr model being the center, the central nucleus is kind of like the sun, and the electrons are rotating around it or moving around it like planets are. Okay. The Bohr model is not actually totally accurate, but it's wonderful for describing um, elements and figuring out how things are going to bond with one another. And we'll discuss that shortly. So if we have a neutral atom of chlorine, the number of protons or the number of positive charges should be equivalent to the number of electrons or negative charges. That's what I mean by a neutral atom positives are equal to the negatives, okay? So 
the question I asked here was how many electrons does a neutral chlorine atom have? And we need to think about this for a minute because to determine the number of electrons, we need to figure out the number of protons, right? Because that's going to tell us the number of electrons we have. So how many protons do we have in any atom of chlorine? Well, we have 17. And hopefully you remember that from uh, previous lectures where the atomic number is equal to the number of protons. And that's kind of the definition. That, that what, that's what makes an atom what it is. So if we have 17 protons, we have a neutral atom of chlorine, that means we also have 17 electrons. Okay, cool. So just keep that number in your head. We're going to talk about how we can draw it. So the first thing we do when we're drawing these structures is we take our nucleus, our protons and our neutrons, and we just simplify it. We just make it a dot. Um, some people will write like CL if, they were, if you were doing chlorine, uh, but it's a dot. And, and that's fine. We don't, we, you know, you can draw 17 protons and you can draw 17 neutrons, but most people aren't interested in that. So we're just going to make it a dot. The next thing that we're going to do now that we have our nucleus written as just a dot is we need to add our shells, which is where our electrons live, right? Remember, I told you the nucleus is like the sun in the Bohr model, and the electrons are going to be floating around outside of that. So this shell represents where our electrons live. Okay. It's also going to represent an energy level, but we'll talk about that later when we get to like photosynthesis. So don't necessarily worry about that right now. So the first shell, the first electron shell can hold two electrons maximum. That's the most that it can hold up to two. So we'll put those there. Remember, we're doing chlorine, so we're trying to get up to 17, right? So we've got one, two. The next shells can hold eight electrons. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So how many do we have so far? How many more do we need? Well, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have ten electrons total, and we need seven more. Okay. So I won't torture you with that. We can add up to eight, and I'll just go ahead and add them. Now we have all 17 of our electrons here. This is our Bohr model of, of chlorine. Okay, and again, you could draw protons and neutrons, but I, I don't want to, and um, most chemists don't want to either. So this is what the chlorine uh, or a chlorine atom looks like under the Bohr model. So the most interesting area of this are these outermost electrons, okay? These are going to be determining what kind of reactions this atom of chlorine is going to undergo, okay? These are called the valence electrons. If you didn't write that in your notes yet, please write that down because valence is a term that you're going to need to know, okay? Valence electrons determine the chemical reactions that a chlorine is going to have. How many valence electrons do we have here? Well, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Cool. Seven valence electrons in chlorine. That is wonderful. So there's actually an easier way to determine the number of valence electrons as opposed to just um, drawing it out every single time. Um, so like, let's say I wanted to figure out how many valence electrons, um, I don't know, uh, iodine over here had. I'd have to potentially, you know, draw 53 little dots following my rules, but there's a much easier way to do this, okay? And that is to use the groups on the periodic table. So group one here, hydrogen, uh, lithium, etc., have one valence electron. And group two, uh, beryllium and magnesium, those have two valence electrons. I'm assuming you can probably by now tell me how many valence electrons there are in boron and aluminum. In all of these, there are three, right? Carbon, silicon have four. Nitrogen has five. Everything in this group has five. Oxygen has six valence electrons. Everything in this group has six electrons. Fluoride, chlorine um, have seven. 
And our noble gases over here have eight valence electrons. So again, everything in this column, there's one valence electron. Everything in this column, there are two valence electrons. Everything in this column, there are three valence electrons, four valence electrons, et cetera, right? So you don't need to draw out the Bohr model like that every time. I was just using it as illustrative to show that you can come to the same conclusion or you can just look at the periodic table. I might ask you to draw something like that on, on an exam, um, just so that you, you're prepared for that kind of question. But the more interesting ones are Lewis dot structures. Okay, let's draw a Lewis dot structure for chlorine. So how many, how many valence electrons does chlorine have? It has seven, right? And how do we know that? Well, you could either draw out the whole entire electron diagram, or you could just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you always jump over these transition metals, by the way. We aren't worried about those guys right now. It's just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's do that one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Chlorine's right there. Seven valence electrons. So here is our central chlorine nucleus. Let's go ahead and add our electrons to it. We're gonna add them in pairs, which is a kind of a hint at what's going to be happening in a minute. Um, so we have our three pairs of electrons and we are left with one unpaired electron. So because of a few different reasons, this unpaired electron makes this an unstable configuration. It makes this chlorine um, quite unstable. Um, the reason for that is because of this thing called the octet rule. Okay, it's called the octet rule. And that's also one uh, to jot down. And atoms want to have filled outer shells of electrons. I just said filled shells here, but they want to have filled valence shells um, of electrons. And so chlorine, in order to fill its outermost shell, it can lose these seven electrons, right? because just inside of, of those seven is another shell that's filled up, right? So chlorine could lose seven electrons or it can just gain one more. And so it's pretty obvious that chlorine is just gonna wanna gain one more electron. It's gonna be a lot easier for chlorine to gain just one electron than it is uh, for chlorine to lose seven. So in order to get another electron and fill its shell, Chlorine pairs with another atom that has one extra electron in its valence shell. So where are all of the atoms with uh, spare valence electrons? You have a couple options here. You, you could draw out the entire structures of these things and you know start with the innermost shell that can hold two and the next shell out that can hold eight. Or you can just look right here in this first group because these are all um, elements that have one extra electron. You can check this if you want. You can see how many valence electrons there are here by drawing it all out if you are so inclined. It's your time, do what you want. Um, but we're just gonna go ahead and grab uh, sodium here because that's a super common, sodium chloride is a very, very common uh, um, compound that you have because you know it's, it's table salt, it's everywhere, sodium chloride. We've got one bonus electron, one extra electron here. We've got seven valence electrons here. And like I was saying, they want to have filled outer shells. So we can draw the Lewis dot structures of these two. So we have sodium, okay? We've got its one electron in its, in its valence shell. We don't need to draw the others because in the Lewis dot structure, you're only gonna need the, the valence electrons. Remember, those are the ones that determine if you're having a chemical reaction or not. Here's our chlorine with our... So just to make this like crystal clear chlorine, has these seven, it wants a filled outer shell, which means it wants to have eight. Sodium has this one, it wants a filled outer shell, which means it wants to get rid of this one. And so what's gonna happen here is actually chlorine is gonna come and steal the sodium atoms. Um, it's gonna come and steal its leftover, its bonus valence electron, seven. When those two things get together, they form sodium chloride. Okay, and I'm going to talk about this equation right here. But when those two things get together, they form sodium chloride. You can see they're kind of sharing a little bit, and we're going to talk about that 
but I want to talk about this equation really quick first. Okay, so the first thing on the far left of any chemical equation is your reactants. Okay, those are the things that are reacting with one another. The arrow here just means, hey, a chemical reaction took place. Some people say this as yields. So Na plus Cl yields NaCl. You can just think of this arrow as, hey, a chemical reaction happened. Uh, and I'll probably be saying yields throughout the semester, so be prepared for that. But the arrow means a chemical reaction happened. Over here is your product. So salt or NaCl is the product of the chemical reaction between chlorine and sodium. Okay, so reactants, a chemical reaction, products. That's how you read um, these chemical equations. And this is what the Lewis dot, um, this is what the dot structure looks like. It's not a Lewis dot actually, but this is what the dot structure looks like. And uh, in the next lecture, we're going to be talking about the fact that this forms and what's called an ionic bond. So let's see, in that lecture, you should have um, figured out the difference between a, um, a compound and a molecule. You should have figured out how to uh, draw electron structures for neutral atoms. Um, you should have figured out how to draw uh, valence diagrams for, um, for any atom. You should figure out how to immediately go on the periodic table and figure out how many valence electrons there are. Um, for particular elements, um, and you should have learned a little something about products, reactants, and how to read a chemical equation. We're going to be seeing a little bit more of that later, uh, but yeah, that's all for right now.